uh, we'll start with the first panel. And just to remind everybody, I'm not going to read the whole methodology page because we don't have a lot of time, but just to let you know that we have a very limited time and a lot of topics to cover. So the presentations um, are expected to last about 15 minutes. After that, the moderator is going to talk to the panelists, and each panelist will have about five minutes to comment and introduce maybe some new topics that haven't been covered by the presenter. And after that, there will be an exchange and a debate moderated by the moderator. So I would like to um, invite Mr. Massimo Tomasoli and his panel. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Welcome, everybody. We have uh, 35 minutes uh, less. We are starting with 35 minutes of delay. So I will uh, refrain from making a, a long introduction. I will just say I'm uh, Massimo Tomazzoli. I'm the Permanent Observer for International IDEA. And I will introduce uh, very briefly uh, the panelists, but you do have a, a full list of their bios in, uh, uh, that, that are distributed. So you, uh, you all know, actually, uh, all of them because they are very famous and it's a very rich panel. Uh, my only uh, pitch for introducing this panel is that uh, we are here in New York on the margins of a general assembly that takes place uh, four years after the adoption of uh, the Agenda 2030. And this was the year that reviewed the implementation of the agenda. So there is plenty of material about global trends on how uh, the international community is actually responding on these uh, commitments. But uh, there are uh, actually, there is a mix, the picture, and this panel will provide an opportunity to zoom in on to some of the main global trends. And for that purpose, our first presenter, who will have uh, some 15 minutes, uh, is uh, my uh, friend and uh, colleague uh, Ingo Pitterle from the uh, UNDESA, he is a socioeconomic affairs officer in the global monitoring, uh, economic monitoring uh, branch, economic analysis and policy division of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Ingo, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. I would first like to um, thank the organizers for inviting UNDESA to participate in this forum. And I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this panel on socioeconomic global trends. So what I'm going to present today is essentially based on the work we're conducting together with um, UN ECLAC, with the other four regional commissions and with UNCTAD for our main United Nations um, report on the state of the global economy, the world economic situation and prospects 2020. And in this report, we're not only going to analyze current macroeconomic issues and trends, but we're also linking them to sustainable development, including um, issues related to poverty, inequality, and environmental sustainability. The full report will be released in next January, and so please um, check it out when it comes. The Situation in the global economy right now is, is rather gloomy and the outlook we have for the, um, for the next two years um, is, is pretty pessimistic. So we will, um, so this is a, a figure which um, um, shows um, um, our um, latest forecast, but we will for the um, on January report um, re probably revise down many individual forecasts and um, also accordingly the global um, um, forecast of, of growth. So the reason, of course, um, is that over the past years we have seen um, how the escalating trade tensions and the heightened policy uncertainty have been increasingly weighing on global um, economic activity. We have seen that confidence indicators have deteriorated sharply, industrial activity has fallen, and private investment has also weakened in many parts of the world economy. What is, stands out is that this growth slowdown we're seeing is not only significant, but it's also very broad-based, both affecting advanced economies, but also many developing countries. According to the latest projections, we have um, 18 out of the 19 G20 countries have, will see lower growth in 2019 than they had in 2018. So the, the one exception um, is, is actually Japan. 
Um, in addition to the trade conflict, I want to emphasize that there are a host of region or country specific factors that have contributed to this deteriorating outlook, such as the, the fading impact of the fiscal stimulus in the US, disruptions to the automotive sector, and the ongoing uncertainty over Brexit in Europe, but also policy uncertainty in many other in many emerging economies, for example, in, in Brazil and in, in Mexico. Um, in addition to the worsening outlook, a major concern, especially from the UN perspective, is that the, the pattern of global growth still remains very uneven. So this is illustrated in, in the map here, where we see the countries that are growing fast in, in green and in dark green, and the countries that are either growing slowly or contracting in white and in red. Um, that's um, and what is most worrisome for us is that we're seeing poor economic performances in many countries that have been already falling behind over the past um, decades or the, or the past years, and where we would, we would need to see growth most, um, um, where growth would be um, needed most. So this is especially the case for um, parts of, of, of Africa and also Latin America and the Caribbean. Of course, the factors behind um, these weak performances are highly country specific, but they often do reflect a combination of, of, of the following issues. There are, for many countries, there are still facing difficulties in recovering from the commodity price shocks, which we have seen between 2013 and, and, and 16, particularly. We are also seeing still um, um, very severe macroeconomic imbalances in many of these countries and at the same time a high degree of policy uncertainty in the environment of, of strong political polarization. And we feel that it's important to, to analyze these issues in, in, in the context and the combination uh, between political dynamics and, and economic factors. When we now look at, um, um, to ahead to 2020, um, we have, as was visible in, in the figure before, we have so far projecting that global growth will stabilize in 2020 and slightly pick up. However, this improvement is anything but certain, and the risks are very clearly tilted to the downside. We see um, several major risk factors. Um, um, first, of course, a further escalation of the trade tensions, um, both uh, between um, China and the United States, but also um, um, globally, which could be spreading to the service sector and gradually affecting more, more regions. Then there is the possibility that the sentiment on financial markets could shift abruptly, given the high degree of, of policy uncertainty, for example, because of Brexit, but also um, um, some other factors, which could lead to potential um, um, tightening of, of liquidity. We also see the post, um, risks of a sharp downturn in one of the major um, economies um, because of weaknesses in, um, uh, in the euro area, in China, and also to some extent and coming up in, in the US. Um, and then there are the um, accelerating effects of climate change, um, which will or are expected to have a particularly severe impact on low income countries and small island developing states. So while this may not be reflected in the overall growth figures, it is a very relevant issue for many of the, of the smaller developing countries. What is behind our um, pessim relatively pessimistic outlook and our concerns going forward is the weakness in many high-frequency indicators we have seen. So here on, on these um, um, two figures, we see this, uh, we document the sharp slowdown in global trade activity, in industrial production, and also um, a deterioration in, in business confidence pretty much across the board. Um, of course, these trends are closely linked to the escalation of the trade war, which we have witnessed over the past year. And with all the news, it's, a bit, um, it's, it's easy to, to lose track of where we stand right now. So the latest figures, which um, I could find, are saying that the U.S. has, is implementing terror, has implemented tariffs on around 350 to 400 billion um, U.S. dollar worth of Chinese products and plans to um, deliver a new wave um, of tariffs um, in mid-December, which would then effectively um, mean that all Chinese goods exported um, to the US are subject to tariffs. China, in turn, has um, um, set tariffs for, to over 100 um, billion um, US dollar worth of US goods, um, which affects um, most of the um, um, imports. 
So the, um, as a consequence of that, the bilateral US-China trade has dropped by um, around 15% this year, and in some industries we have seen uh, much sharper declines. In agriculture, um, US agriculture, but also um, Chinese electrics and electronics. Um, on top of that, there's also a sharp increase in the number of unresolved trade disputes at the WMTO. So this, the number of trade disputes between 2017 and, and 18 has more than doubled. So given these developments, it's um, not such a big surprise that we have seen trade slowing a lot. And this figure just shows that in the first half of 2019, um, global import demand has is essentially stagnated. Um, so we are seeing that the, the, the big four contributors to demand, the US, emerging Asia, other advanced economies, and the Euro area, have essentially um, not contributed to anything. So that as a result, um, trade has stagnated. The big concern, of course, is that this weakness in trade will then um, gradually um, um, affect um, production in, in other areas, so especially um, investment. And we're already seeing that it has um, um, impacted investment in, um, next slide, um, yeah, it has, it's impacting investment um, in, um, especially in, in Australia and, and Canada, and also to some extent in the US and uh, Europe, and um, yeah, so far Japan is holding up. So um, what um, the concern here, of course, is that it will, investment is weighing on economic activity now, but it will also um, dampen the medium term prospects for growth. So this could mean that the um, effects um, we're seeing will be um, um, much, uh, much more significant going forward. In response to this weak um, global conditions, the, um, um, we have seen quite a, a forceful move by, by central banks around the world. Um, so um, we've seen um, that a large um, majority of central banks have eased monetary policy in 2019, and this is a really a significant turnaround from what, was, what happened in 2018. So in 2018, the majority of central banks still um, with, um, um, tightened monetary policy, and we are now seeing that it's like 80% of central banks which um, uh, loosened monetary policy. We have seen two Fed rates cuts and the ECB embarking on a new bond buying program, and also um, China had already implemented monetary easing measures in, in 2018. So um, while we believe that these measures have reduced some short-term risks um, and helped to stabilize global um, financial markets and, ca and capital for the emerging economies, there's also uh, questions about how effective will these measures be in stimulating real sector activity. And more importantly, there's also worries that they may exacerbate financial imbalances and fuel further debt accumulation, um, raising medium-term um, risks. On the fiscal front, we have also seen some um, move towards easier policies, but much less pronounced than on the monetary side. While there's a clear move away from large fiscal tightening, there's only a small share of countries that are really have moved into, into significant easing. And the main reason for that is that debt levels are um, extremely high and have kept on rising, so which is making uh, many of the, um, of, of the authorities just being, being cautious. I want to make um, um, three, um, highlight three types of concerns uh, related to on, on the debt front. One is uh, related to financial risks, where it is really very important that we differentiate between different um, areas of vulnerability, institutional weaknesses in the euro area, um, the um, lower rated corporate um, bond sector in the US, or in emerging markets, rising corporate and household debt, often denominated in dollars. The second point is that even when financial st stability risks are low and high, um, uh, high debt levels pose a heavy burden on government finances because interest payments are often very high and they cannot be um, used for, for development purposes. And third, which is very important also for many Latin American countries, it um, high debt limits limit fiscal policy space to tackle the potential downturn. Um, now, this weak economic performance, which we're seeing right now, is exacerbating um, um, development challenges. And this is the major concern for, um, um, for the United, 
for the United Nations. So we're seeing in this figure a couple of stylized facts. We're seeing this long-run underperformance in several developing regions, Southern Africa, Central Africa, and Latin America, and the Caribbean. And, and most recently, since 2017, the, the prospects have been particularly weak. So this is actually also shown in a figure on labor productivity, which was mentioned in the um, presentation before, where we see that in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is the dark blue line, labor productivity growth, um, this is a, actually a five-year moving average, has been basically below 2% per year for the past four decades. And this is, of course, um, the co one core element of the, of the problem. As a result of the recent weakness, um, we have seen that poverty levels have increased in, um, in some parts of the world. Um, so we have done some estimates here um, on, um, for specific reasons. So poverty rates globally have still declined, I want to emphasize, but they have risen in a few um, um, countries, especially in, um, and, and very populous countries often, especially in Africa and, and parts of Latin America and Caribbean. And this, of course, um, is a major concern. And when we look at um, global um, um, poverty uh, um, scenarios for 2030, the uh, 2000 deadline for the sustainable development goals, we see that even in a best case scenario where we, economic growth in these affected countries picks up, especially in Africa, LDCs picks up, and we see a move towards a more uh, better income uh, distribution, we will still have a sizable um, portion of the um, um, people will live in extreme poverty. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ingo. I think, uh, you deserve a round of applause, uh, also because you uh, really made the best use of uh, the limited uh, uh, commodity that is time uh, uh, in this panel. Uh, I, um, I would like to just change the order of the speakers because um, former President uh, Felipe Calderon will have another engagement. So we will start uh, with him uh, and then we will go on uh, with the previous order. You have the floor. Thank you. I really apologize for that, but I need to catch a flight. And with this horrible traffic, I think it's, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make it. You have my presentation, isn't it? Well, quickly, I'm sorry, the slides are in Spanish, but basically, okay, so roughly what we are seeing is clearly we have an incredible pressure, as it was already said, but the, we are advancing quite less economic growth everywhere. Of course, uh, most that is due to the end of an economic, very long economic cycle, but also with the, the tensions associated with the trade and war that is uh, taking place right now. And of course, the investment is going down almost everywhere, and in particular in this year, some investment is uh, showing very negative data, in particular in Latin America. So if we take some regional perspectives, is uh, clearly in Euro, uh, we can see some downside. It, it took a lot of time for Europe to recover after the economic crisis in 2009, and actually it observed a very strong economic growth, but now the trend is clearly negative. It's still economic growth is positive, but the trend is clear. The same is uh, Japan is quite stable, to be honest, after several decades without grow, economic growth. Uh, Japan is showing positive economic growth still, but very few, but it's good for that such a big economy. I think one of the main uh, concerning topics is China. Of course, everybody will love to have a growth of 6% like China, but we can see a trend clearly which is negative. But also, uh, of course, uh, not always we can rely on the formal data coming from the government and communist party. So we can build, uh, and somebody does a proxy of the Chinese economy, a proxy bill with, for instance, the demand for energy, the cargo on the trains, and of, uh, the rate of the number of imports, some prices in real estate and so on. And that index was, that index was very close to the real formal GDP. Suddenly, like a four years ago, uh, the index went down dramatically, meaning probably the data were not exactly a cure coming from the government. But also it recovered uh, like a two, one year ago. Now the index is going down as well. 
But even the formal figures are demonstrating that Chinese economy is going down. And probably next year, at least the OECD uh, forecast is saying that it's going to surpass the threshold of 6%. So it's going to be less than 6%, which is some kind of phantasmagoric spectrum in the Chinese economy. You see the industrial production and sales, retailing, uh, it's negative both in the trend and it's going to reach, for instance, industrial production, the lowest point since China got into the WTO. So uh, it, we are seeing a clear problem uh, in that uh, big economy <coughs> and with some impacts. For instance, Russia, uh, had an incredible recession due to oil prices, and now Russia is recovering probably due to these oil prices, but also because they are maybe gaining or taking some gains from the world trade between the United States and China. So more sales, more Russian sales to China could, could be fostered in some part of the economic growth, for instance, primary sector. And what about the United States? Honestly, it looks very, very pretty. I think it's quite stable. It has been a very long expansion period. Um, a lot of people are starting to talk about uh, a potential stagnations in the future, but the numbers are so good, to be honest. Uh, but the problems we, that the economy will face next year in electoral year is maybe the president uh, will face some risk associated with not exactly the argument of full employment. And the problem is coming in particular for this side. So forget about the, the left side of the slide, are the measures taken either by China or the United States in this trade war. But uh, what I want to emphasize is the impact. First, in the global GDP, it is estimated that will, uh, if, if this uh, trade war continues, it's going to have an impact at less 0.65% in the global GDP, associated with less economic, with trade, global trade everywhere. And it's going to have an impact in the Chinese economy and an impact in the American economy, almost 1%. So the main enemy of economic growth and prosperity and probably the trigger for a potential recession in the future will be this trade, world trade between the United States and China. And I hope that uh, at the end of the day, both presidents and both economies could understand that nobody is able to win such kind of war. So we are contemplating a show of losers everywhere associated with that. What happened with Latin America? Unfortunately, uh, the region is, has an incredible correlation with the price of commodities and raw materials. Look at this, for instance, the correlation between uh, the GDP in Brazil and the price of commodities in the region. This is the price of commodities, and was, somebody was saying, uh, of course, the peak, negative peak is exactly the recession, 2009 is in the middle. Previously to that, it was an uh, incredible growing trend which explained the very famous, the golden decade of Latin America, the first decade of this century, but it's associated with the price of commodities, and price of commodities are associated with the entrance of China to WTO. Then there was the recession, and that is negative. That is the price of commodities. Look, now, the GDP of Brazil is absolutely correlated with that. So the recession Brazil observed uh, for almost four years, three years in a row, recently is associated with that, but also with lack of competitiveness of the Brazilian economy. And if you consider other economies in the region, you, you can see that Latin America is losing, is losing its capacity to grow. And it's an incredible structural problem. Why? Because, as it was said, we are losing comp uh, labor competitiveness. Maybe the increase in the informal economy, no formal economy, is killing the competitiveness in the labor side uh, because we are unable to transfer our economies in more open, more associated with manufacturing. And now Latin America is suffering two additional problems. One is violence and crime and the lack of rule of law, which is killing the economy as well in several parts of, of, of the region. And also the economy is now mutating to a new kind of economic growth associated with knowledge. And the lack of quality of education in the region is having an impact in our economy. Well, finally, well, of course, the cows in Venezuela, the black hole there is impacting everywhere, but also what is happening in Argentina and now Mexico, um, I will end with this, Mexico is expecting to have zero 
a rate of zero economic growth, and of course that is provoking a uh, very bad impact on that. So I will finish with me present my presentation to that, to respect the time, and I want to express my gratitude, and I, I apologize, Danilo, about this. I need to catch a flight, and thank you all. It's glad to see you. Thank you very much, uh, Felipe, for a very uh, inspiring and uh, matter of factual presentation with, uh, with data, uh, very, very important. I now give the floor to uh, former president of uh, Slovenia, uh, Danilo Turk, who is also a veteran of the UN. Uh, I think we first uh, met when uh, you were representing your country uh, at the UN and subsequently work, uh, worked for the DPA. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, and let me say that I feel particularly privileged to be part of this important discussion today, uh, actually representing a club of former presidents, Club de Madrid, uh, which is an organization that brings together around 110 former presidents, democratically elected, and obviously concerned with developments around the world and trying to help in the way they can with advice uh, with uh, participation in important policy discussions, some of which have to do with uh, questions of social development and democracy, because these two aspects of development are very closely linked. Uh, we believe that democracy has future if it delivers, so delivery is an important aspect of vitality of democracy, and this is what, what motivates us to take part in discussions like the one today. Now, uh, you mentioned that uh, I am a veteran of UN activities, and in some ways it is true. I'm now 67 years old, and I have spent like 40 years in various activities of the United Nations. And it has to do with social development to a very large extent. Uh, a student, I was following fairly regularly the work, the reports on the UNRIS, the UN Research Institute for Social Development, the World Social Progress reports, uh, which were quite important in 1970s and 80s. Uh, I was later involved in human rights discussions as a rapporteur on economic, social and cultural rights, produced several reports on the subject formulated uh, the draft of the UN Declaration on the Right to Development together with a number of my Latin American colleagues and, and so on. So that was my previous work and when I worked when, since between 2000 and 2005 for Kofi Annan as his assistant for political affairs, at that time we were focusing on what became known as Millennium Development Goals. And that was actually quite an interesting experience because Following the end of Cold War, we have seen a danger of practically collapse of international development cooperation. But then the UN organized a series of conferences which went beyond economics, which went into social development quite strongly, starting with the Rio Conference on Environment, of course, but then it was also women, it was urban development, it was many other social development aspects. And that allowed the UN to come with a very succinct eight-point program, single-page program, which was designed to be very short because we understood that the attention span of decision makers is extremely short. And of course, that has actually triggered a further level of discussion which brought into the picture quite a few basic questions of social development into what was predominantly macroeconomic discussion until then. Now, in the beginning of this meeting today, we heard two fascinating presentations about the, the global economic outlook and macroeconomic tendencies uh, by uh, Ingo Peterle and by President Calderon. And obviously, this is an important context. This is an important aspect of reality in which we live and in which we have to think hard about how to improve human condition. This is not an easy task. And what may happen in such circumstances is that social development aspects get the place in the back burner. And that is something that must not happen. The UN has gone beyond the economists' purely descriptions of growth, growth potential, growth difficulties, and so forth. Now, I'm coming from Slovenia, which has currently growth, the GDP growth rate about 2.7%, which is not particularly high, but by European Union standards, it's, it's pretty good. 
but we are already concerned about how to develop uh, areas such as healthcare. We have an aging population, and that, of course, is a big social problem, which translates directly into political difficulties. How to develop further our educational system so as to cope with the uh, what, it was, what is called Fourth Industrial Revolution. I'm sure that in Latin America, the same kind of problems are also very important aspects of political agenda. Now, again, uh, what I would like to mention in this uh, uh, discussion, as in my introductory statement in the panel, are simply two points. First, even if the macroeconomic picture doesn't look good, one must not reduce the priority importance of social aspects of development. Point number one. Point number two, social aspects of development include the question of income inequality, which must not be deferred for some better time in the future, because that better time in the future will never come. So one has to find ways of addressing the question of income inequality in this kind of circumstances. Now, obviously, we lived through the period of deregulation for the last uh, generation, practically, and it is very difficult to re-establish a kind of normalcy in which the state would be expected to regulate with a sense of justice and fairness. Uh, this may look like luxury in, 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 the, in the difficult times like ours. Uh, but uh, my second point is therefore uh, one that I would like to address here because I'm sure that many of, many of you have much more knowledge of economics than I do. The proposal is simply this. Uh, we should not consider economics only as a question of self-interest and profit. And there is a need to add to the economic bottom line something that is called in some of the contemporary discussion social impact bottom line. Now, I do not have the time to elaborate on this. I'm sure you are familiar with these concepts. You are, I'm sure that you are familiar with the US Business Roundtable, which has recently claimed the need to go beyond profit, beyond the needs of shareholders into social responsibility. So businesses themselves have to do something to contribute to social justice. This is my second point and my final point. I so, I'm sorry for this telegraphic style, but I mean, we, we work in a shortage of time and I, I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have come to learn that uh, sometimes uh, this uh, style is actually very effective in communicating what you think and uh, you have been particularly effective. Now, the next uh, uh, speaker is... Uh, and maybe you can uh, have the uh, Raul Feliz, uh, director of Raul Feliz and Asociados, prof professor at the Centro de Investigación y Docencias, Docencia Económica, CIDE. Thank you for the invitation to the Global Forum. I will switch uh, the language, um, we will speak in Spanish. I've um, encontrado muy interesante los comentarios de Ingo, del de expresidente Calderón y del expresidente Danilo. Me gustaría enfocar un poco mis comentarios sobre temas eh, de mediano o largo plazo de la situación que vivimos. De nuevo, nos comentaba Ingo, estamos viviendo un momento donde el crecimiento económico parece debilitarse. Y uno de los grandes temas es si caminamos hacia una recesión global. Tal vez algunas regiones del mundo están ya entrando a una recesión, este, pero la pregunta es si esto se va a generalizar en los próximos dos años. Recordemos que este sería el décimo año de esta expansión y que desde la Segunda Guerra Mundial aproximadamente cada cinco años y medio, seis años, hemos tenido una recesión. Por lo tanto, estamos en un periodo largo y una recesión que apareciera en los próximos años, dos años, no sería un fenómeno necesariamente anormal, sería dentro de lo lógico. Entonces, cierta desaceleración o recesión seguramente la veremos hacia adelante. 
pero, y en particular, y, y creo que es importante esto, eh, el ambiente de guerra comercial, pues, vía un canal puramente comercial, pero más importante mediante la incertidumbre que genera y que es el principal factor que ha detenido el nivel de inversión prácticamente en todo el mundo. Hemos visto una caída en las tasas de inversión aquí mismo en los Estados Unidos, en los países emergentes, en Europa. Entonces, la combinación de la caída del nivel de inversión más la caída del comercio, pues está generando, pienso yo, una desaceleración de aproximadamente uno a uno y medio del crecimiento global. Que todo eso, pues, podría generar una recesión. Pero la gran pregunta es, en el décimo año de esta expansión, eh, todavía los bancos centrales no han podido, por lo menos en los países desarrollados, generar tasas de interés positivas, sostenidas. Y todavía los balances fiscales no generan superávit primarios. Entonces, de alguna forma, esta expansión ha sido sostenida por incentivos extraordinarios desde el punto de vista macro. Eh, hoy, y ustedes lo saben bien, eh, por lo menos cuatro o cinco países, por ejemplo, Alemania, eh, tiene toda su curva de rendimientos de la deuda soberana alemana en tasas negativas. Y ese es uno de los grandes temas hacia adelante, un tema que hace 10 años no se oía hablar de esta situación. ¿Cómo vivir en un entorno de tasas negativas? ¿Cómo vivir en un entorno de trampa de liquidez global? Y si las reglas fiscales y monetarias que hemos conocido y las instituciones y los marcos de procedimiento que se han desarrollado son los adecuados para este entorno de tasas negativas. Eh, ¿Por qué tenemos un crecimiento tan débil? ¿Por qué no es posible eh, que este crecimiento aún débil y debilitándose se pueda sostener con tasas de interés reales positivas y con balances primarios? Esa es la gran pregunta hacia adelante. Eh, Ingo hablaba de la caída en la productividad. Eh, entonces, un gran economista eh, de hace muchos años, del siglo pasado, eh, eh, keynesiano, pero eh, Larry Sommer lo ha traído de nuevo a, a vida, habla de una especie de estancamiento secular. <risa> eh, y esa es la gran pregunta. ¿Estamos viviendo en un entorno de estancamiento secular? Es decir, solamente haciendo cosas extraordinarias podemos mantener un crecimiento mediocre o no. Y esto trae a tema, la política, los bancos centrales han hecho hasta lo imposible por tratar de sostener este crecimiento a través de políticas heterodosas, expansión cuantitativa, tasa cero, tasa negativa en Europa, eh, en Japón, y aún así hablamos pues, de, un, de una casi imposibilidad de sostener este crecimiento. Eh, la gran pregunta hacia adelante, y el uh, gobernador Draghi, del Banco Central Europeo lo puso sobre la mesa, ¿no es el momento de una expansión fiscal? Y si es el momento de una expansión fiscal, ¿qué tipo de expansión fiscal? Eh, el presidente Trump eh, en, en Estados Unidos hizo una expansión fiscal vía una reducción de impuestos, pero es, esa expansión fiscal no parece haber tenido efectos duraderos, porque hoy estamos viendo una baja importante en la tasa de inversión en los propios Estados Unidos, no obstante que la tasa corporativa bajó del 34 al 21%. La pregunta es, ¿qué tipo de expansión fiscal? Eh, lo, lo, dejo, lo dejo como una pregunta y diría una expansión fiscal productiva. En un entorno de tasas de interés cero o negativas, no es el momento de que el mundo se aboque a un gran proyecto de infraestructura? Esa es mi pregunta. Muchísimas gracias, Raúl, también para eh, escuchar mi lenguaje del, del cuerpo para, para decirte que el tiempo se acabó. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, reference, uh, uh, adding an additional perspective. Uh, on interest rates and the, and the policies of central banks and what they can actually achieve. Now, the next uh, uh, speaker is 
Rob Wood, uh, Principal Economist, Manager, Country Risk Service, Latin America and the Caribbean at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, a little bit, it's been mentioned quite a lot today, uncertainty um, and how that's affecting the, the global economy. Um, I'm also going to talk about the uh, trade war between US and China and how we see it developing the next year in the medium and uh, longer term. And then <clears throat> I want to turn to uh, mention some of our uh, risk scenarios that at the Economist Intelligence Unit we develop and update on a monthly basis as part of our monthly global outlook that is sort of part of the core of our forecast for the global economy. As I mentioned, uh, the word uncertainty has been uh, bandied about quite a lot this morning, and I think it has, you know, it, it has been impacting um, the global economy, and it will continue to do so. Um, and I wanted to bring it up because there's been, um, in the last year, an interesting development. Uh, um, officials at the IMF and an academic at Stanford University have developed a world uncertainty index which is based on the EIU country reports and what they've done is they've looked at the frequency, uh, the number of times that EIU analysts in their country reports mentioned the word uncertainty related to politics, economics and trade. And I don't have a slide up for you I'm afraid, uh, but I do, I have downloaded the data and you can all do this if you go online and Google a world um, uncertainty index. There's also a variant world trade uncertainty index, uh, which obviously shows a, a big surge of late. And you can download the latest data and uh, this team uh, that's compiling this index uh, does it on a quarterly basis, so we have the data till the second quarter of 2019. And what we can see is since the beginning of 2018, a rise in the index, particularly for um, with regard for the weighted average for the, of the global economy, so that's taking uh, the larger economies and providing a greater weighting, for example, the US, China, etc. And that's showing how uncertainty has more than doubled since uh, 2018. And that's been driven um, in uh, not just by the US and China, but also developments in the Eurozone, uncertainty over Brexit, for example. Uh, and we'll be, you know, we'll be tracking this. I think it's a useful, um, useful measure to gauge the amount of uncertainty in the global economy. And I think it is uh, feeding into uh, global economic performance. One of the key things is the trade war. Um, aside from that, uh, as my colleagues have mentioned, we have had a long US economic cycle, and that's slowing down, that's contributing to the slowdown. But I think a lot of the tension is on the US-China uh, trade war. Um, our view at the Economist Intelligence Unit is that there won't be um, a meaningful deal before the November 2020 elections. Uh, we do see sort of there is a slim upside risk of there being a deal, uh, but we don't see anything meaningful until after the elections. I think the Chinese government will be playing uh, sort of the long game to see which administration will be in office, and if there were another four years of the Trump administration, then uh, I think the, uh, the, the Chinese regime would then decide, you know, what sort of deal can we make, what, to what extent can we do the, uh, the, the domestic reforms uh, as part of a deal that the U.S. are looking for. Uh, if the Democrats get in, I think there would still, um, it, it would sort of change the, uh, the game, obviously. The, in terms of the tariffs, the Democrats would see that more of a legacy um, of uh, the Trump administration, and they'd look to dial those down, and there would eventually be some sort of a deal. Uh, and that could support uh, an upturn in the, uh, the global economy uh, from uh, 21, 22 onwards. Um, but one of the key things I wanted to mention is that the um, the trade war really, we see it moving from uh, 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 a conflict around tariffs on manufacturing and moving towards a conflict 
uh, sort of a strategic, you know, conflict as this strategic rivalry between the US and China plays out um, around technology, uh, investment, finance, and security. So you're going to see a lot of these issues coming to the fore. And some of these issues are what could um, turn the global downturn into a recession. And I just want to turn very briefly to three of our negative, of our 10 negative scenarios that we have uh, this year for the, this month for the global economy. And that is that the US-China trade war splits more clearly the global trade system and disrupts supply chains over the next two years. We see that as a very high probability. So probability of more than 40% of that happening. And the impact that that would have on the global economy would be to, um, it would have a high impact. It would hurt growth by between one and two percentage points of GDP. The second negative scenario is that the trade war spreads into the financial sphere. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A if, if we want. Uh, we see a moderate probability of that and a very high impact of that. So that would have an impact of more than two percentage points uh, of GDP on, uh, on the global economy. And the third one of the 10 risk scenarios that we look at in our global outlook is that um, you know, we look at some of the, uh, outside the, the trade war space, we look at the elevated level of US uh, uh, dollar denominated debt, particularly in the corporate sector, including in the US, uh, but also in emerging markets, uh, and how the, you know, there is a risk that that could, um, as we saw in 2018, cause difficulties in some countries, but cause greater difficulties for the global economy and bring the economy down as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now uh, ended our panelists uh, for uh, the day, for the presentations of today. Unfortunately, uh, Adam uh, Posnan was supposed to uh, speak now had another engagement, so he couldn't uh, actually address uh, this panel. This um, uh, is, uh, I think, a very a composite picture that emerges from the various presentations. So um, uh, I would like to uh, provide an opportunity for uh, some interaction among the panelists and then get uh, to the public for your uh, questions and answers. I'm told uh, by uh, my friend and colleague Natasha that we may stretch maybe another 15 minutes into the lunch break since we started with 35 minutes of delay. So uh, I'm, I'm just asking now uh, to uh, you, how would you react to the positions expressed by uh, your fellow panelists? Uh, Danilo Turk. Well, um, we have had a very fascinating presentation of a situation which can be defined only as a very uh, unpromising, really, a very dangerous, uh, bringing risks. Uh, but of course, there were specific points made, and I would like to, to very briefly refer to some of them. Now, on the US-China trade war, I think we, we shouldn't treat this as a kind of a natural disaster. Uh, that trade war didn't happen for some objective reason. It happened because the US president wanted trade war. That is what he said. He said trade wars are good and are easy to win. They are smart and easy to win. To that, the then chairman of the European Union Council um, re responded, Donald Tusk, he responded, no, trade wars are stupid and are easy to lose. That was the reaction last year. So we, we, I think we have to have a certain clarity, certainly if I, if I may put it this way, a certain minimum of moral clarity in these matters. And of course this is important if we want to advise you know, political change uh, to happen. So uh, that's, that's one thing about the US-China trade war. Uh, then of course all this talk about China being a financial manipulator and economic, um, manip that is a technology manipulator and theft of technology and all that stuff. I mean, you know, this is a kind of a war mongering um, uh, talk, uh, much of which is not well founded. Um, there, of course, there are elements of truth there, but much of it is not well founded. And I think that uh, international uh, political uh, class should really have a certain level of m actually minimum, uh, minimum clarity in these matters. 
that's my first point. The second point about the type of fiscal expansion. I think this is really a very interesting question, uh, something that I think this circle would probably productively discuss. I am not a specialist, so I, I do not claim to have the expertise. If I had, I would probably hesitate to say anything. Since I don't, I'm, a, I'm less hesitant, <laughs> I would say. But I do remember when I was president and the crisis started back in 2008, in Europe there were various types of reactions. And part of that had to do with fiscal policies. Uh, and obviously, as you know, the whole burden of crisis was moved to the fiscal sector. Uh, well, that's, that's how it, things changed and eventually produced a very negative political result because much of the populist uh, upheaval that we now see has its origins in the fiscal policies of that period. Now, but there are two types of reactions which, which I think are quite relevant to the current discussion on the question of fiscal expansion. Um, um, I talked to several presidents at the time and some of them were saying, well, look, of course, we have to reduce our budgets, we have to in introduce budget cuts and this and that, but we are not going to cut anything on research and development. We'll actually expand investment in research. And those countries are faring much better now than those who were saying, you know, we are going to cut across the board and then obviously at one point the, the crisis will ease and, and will come back to normal. So, I mean, the question of the responsibility of government to wisely distribute uh, whatever is the fiscal capacity uh, is really great and I think that it would be useful. Now, we heard that in Latin America there is a need to invest in education, uh, probably research and such things. Uh, these are all aspects of economic and social policy which have to be, um, you know, not only seen in the picture but also discussed in terms of how to go ahead. Each country is different, clearly I'm not suggesting that there is a single formula, but we were challenged by the question of the type of fiscal expansion, so I think it's, it's, it would be useful to continue this discussion. Thank you very much, Danilo. This, uh, this is in fact uh, responding to uh, what uh, Raul was saying about the, the type of expansion and whether it is productive or not. Do you want to add something on that? Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think uh, the European uh, Union situation is unique because uh, you have 19 nations, and then they have been unable to put together uh, a policy to produce fiscal expansion. Because, uh, as we all well know, uh, Italy has a deficit, Spain has a deficit, but Germany has a big surplus. So, uh, the distribution, uh, if you see, if you compare the European situation versus uh, the US, you have, it's running right now about 5% of GDP deficit, while uh, the European Union as a conglomerate is only 0.5% deficit. So I agree with Chairman uh, Draghi that the US need, uh, the European Union need a fiscal expansion, and the European Central Bank is willing to finance the fiscal expansion. But I think the problem is a policy, political problem. How to uh, agree uh, that the, the country has surpluses, like uh, the North European countries, uh, willing to make uh, or to finance uh, uh, an infrastructure project for Europe. For the United States, I think uh, that a, uh, my view is that the trade war is, is no a positive development. Uh, clearly, it's a, a lose, lose game for everybody. Um, the Federal Reserve have made his back force to offset the negative effect of the trade war. But I don't sure they could offset completely the, 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 the shock. So the economy, if something is not agreed soon, uh, the economy will weaken next year. But uh, I think uh, some agreement will be found. So, uh, the U.S. have the, in spite of have 5% deficit of GDP, I think has the capacity 
to introduce fiscal expansion through infrastructure projects. But also I found a political disagreement between Democrat and Republican, and in electoral year to find an agreement to make this expansion. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, Ingo wanted to say something. Yeah, I just um, want to um, also underscore um, the importance which was mentioned before that we're living in really extraordinary macroeconomic times right now. And I think this makes policy make, puts policymakers in very, very challenging situations um, because some of the key relationships which have determined uh, macroeconomic policy making over the past decades um, have broken down essentially. I mean, when I'm thinking about the Phillips curve, the relationship between unemployment and, and inflation, at the same time we're seeing extraordinary low interest rates which are not stimulating um, investments. We're seeing that uh, most of the, um, that even in, in very um, um, good times, um, um, debt and we see further accumulation of debt rather than um, surpluses. So this is a very, very um, a complex situation. Yeah. And then there's a, a second point I want to make which relates to the commodity dependence. I found this chart on uh, the relationship for, for a country like Brazil, which is not known to be the most commodity dependent country uh, in the world, um, quite striking. And I think it is a, um, this is not a new phenomenon. I mean, commodity dependence as an issue and the resource curse is well known. And I think it's a big question of why in 2019 we still have like more than 90 developing and transition economies being commodity dependent and um, why these countries are, their fortunes are so closely tied to the price of common commodities, even though we know that this is a, an, a massive obstacle to, to long-term development. Thank you, Ingo. That's a very interesting nuance that you had. I, uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Rob, uh, you made a very, very interesting um, description of three uh, risk uh, scenarios. But um, over the last uh, decade, I always uh, heard that we should address risks and opportunities at the same time. So I just wonder whether you have also any opportunity scenario in your analysis. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, when I'm interacting with our global economics team, I, I often pitch in, maybe we should have a positive risk scenario. And we have had some in the past, particularly last, last year, um, before that, you know, when we did have sort of the upswing, when there's a lot of uh, optimism about the, the U.S. economy post uh, the corporate tax cuts, and you know, the U.S. economy was was going very quickly. We haven't had a neg uh, we haven't had a positive scenario for for quite a while. So, I mean, the opportunities are in that the global economy is still growing, um, and you know, Raoul's mentioned, uh, you know, there is a great sort of infrastructure deficit out there, uh, there are opportunities to invest in infrastructure. You know, there are lots of opportunities in the global economy, um, and um, you know, uh, th those will just be sort of dampened by this global uh, downturn. Uh, we're still expecting sort of a recovery in the medium term. So yeah, there are opportunities out there. Um, I just wanted to sort of follow up on this very interesting discussion around um, the need for, for, fiscal, for fiscal stimulus to try to prop up the global economy at this, this point in time and going into 2020. And look at it from a Latin American point of view um, and, and also a developing countries' point of view. I think you know, those countries, those blocks will be looking at the advanced world to see you know, the extent to which the US and the Eurozone can, um, uh, can lift the economy. After the global financial crisis, of course, what saved Latin America via commodity prices, demand and prices was a big stimulus from China, huge stimulus in GDP terms, you know, much bigger than uh, what the, uh, the, the advanced economies delivered. That's unlike, stimulus from China is, is pretty unlikely, uh, I think, at this, at this juncture. I think developing countries will therefore be looking at the US and Eurozone. I think, you know, their uh, uh, electoral dynamics will come into play as well as, you know, getting these infrastructure projects off the ground, as it were, and making them happen. You know, it's, uh, it's not something that you can do sort of overnight, even though, you know, there are a lot of projects that are in the pipeline. So Latin America will be looking for the global, sort of global stimulus. Um, 
because I don't think there'll be much room for countries in Latin America and other countries, uh, my focus is on Latin America, to go about much fiscal stimulus themselves. Perhaps some of the countries with healthier finances, such as uh, Chile, they've announced um, efforts at the margin to, um, to help to prop up uh, the economy. But in other economies like Brazil, you're still in a phase of fiscal consolidation, so they have the pension reform, which seems to be going through. But you have very limited discretionary uh, spending uh, and very um, you know, recently very uh, reduced space for uh, public work spending. Um, there's been a lot of attention regarding cuts to the education uh, budget, uh, you know, the R&D space, uh, as you were saying, you know, this is sort of an important thing for economies to, to be able to sustain. A lot of these economies in Latin America you know, don't have that space and they're still looking to consolidate the public finances. Then we have Argentina you know, facing uh, a few turbulent years. Mexico is an interesting one. Uh, when we look at debt, you know, one, of the, one of the things that we look at in terms of is there fiscal space for stimulus is the debt ratio. So in Mexico, it's actually lower than in places like uh, Brazil, um, Uruguay, Argentina, um, and you know there is some space, but um, the concern that the markets have was that if you know you would have some sort of fiscal slippage, then that's going to sort of put the public finances on an unsustainable path, and that's going to lift, that's going to uh, contribute to rising uh, financing costs, and that's going to take. Mexico away from a reasonably comfortable fiscal position right now to less comfortable positions uh, that other countries in South America are having to face, such as Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina now. So I think there's limited space for uh, countries in Latin America fiscal stimulus, and they'll be looking for help from the developed uh, world. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, actually, we have now completed this round and thank you for your interventions. Let me just try to uh, sum it up uh, uh, and open the floor. We heard about uh, policy space and the, the power of governments for adopting proper policies and the constraints that exist uh, when you look at public expenditure, when you look at competitiveness and the capacity to uh, enhance it uh, with proper incentives. And the very important message that came from um, President uh, Danilo Turk about uh, the linkages between uh, social policies and economic uh, uh, growth policies, which is very important in turn when you look at the democracy angle. That is that there is a, an increasing polarization in politics and uh, some of the dissatisfactions and frustrations that are felt by people uh, turn into supporting political movements that are against uh, uh, cooperation, maybe against uh, globalization, uh, and against eventually even uh, multilateralism and, and multilateral uh, solutions to global problems. So, are there in the uh, audience uh, interventions? And please uh, pose, if you can, the question specifically to a panelist. And um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, identify yourself uh, when you take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for a very interesting and motivating panel and discussion. I just wanted to strengthen a, a point that I think is very important that was made in terms of the policy space, but also in terms of policy tools. What we are observing is that worldwide, and in the case, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Daniel Titelman from the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, basically, what I, I want to strengthen is that it's a debate of policy space, but also of policy tools. And what, what, what we are observing is that the effectiveness of monetary policy is coming down. And as economists, we were mainstream economists geared to think that the cycle was always driven by monetary policy and we should leave fiscal policy to adjust during the cycle. And I, and I agree that many countries may not have the capacity to do counter-cyclical policy, but we have to think of fiscal policy in a more structural way. 
And, and we have to see if we are decelerating. We have economies that are coming down. Monetary policy effectiveness is not working. I mean, it's coming down. Well, we have to think how we're going to use fiscal policy. We know we have uh, budgeting constraints, but we have to be more creative and think, and I think that the answer is infrastructure, but in gen more general terms, is investment. We're observing that we have productivity drops at the regional and world levels. Uh, we have a lot of an investment dro uh, dropping in everywhere. So we need to speed up public investment and private investment. So I think that we have to think in terms of fiscal policy, not only in terms of counter-cyclical, where budgeting constraints can be harder, but we have to see it from a more structural uh, perspective and see how it can help regain growth in terms of medium term. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a gentleman from the back. And please, again, identify yourself and uh, keep your comments short. And if you have a question, address it to uh, a panelist. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Massimo. I'm Vinicius Pinheiro. I'm the ILO Special Representative to the United Nations. I would like to uh, ask a question to President Turk. Uh, so if you are following the, the GA this week and the different summits, so basically there is a great disconnect between what's happening at the GA hall, which is the general debate, the president's exposing the views about multilateralism, conflicts and geopolitics, etc., and the two, uh, at least the two summits, the climate summit and the SDG summit that, that uh, ended today. At the GA Hall, we see the world in 2019, 2020, all the conflicts, the questions about multilateralism. And on the Climate Summit, SDG Summit, is the world still in 2015? And so basically, the commitments that were made there, a lot of asks, of course, for accelerating progress, etc. And there is a great, there's no, it's, it looks like totally different worlds. So if you go to a meeting, go to another one, maybe it's the same people, yeah, on one hand, some more optimistic um, in terms of uh, commitments and let's accelerate action. But on the other hand, that those saying, okay, why, why are you doing this? Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. When we were negoci negotiating the 2030 agenda, um, actually we knew that uh, it will last at least until 2025, because after 2025, they'll probably start another discussion, what's, gonna, what's coming next. So the question to you is, do you think there is any hope that the 2020 agenda will last at least at, until 2025? Thank you very much, uh, Vinicius. Uh, I may add that you work at the ILO and you represent ILO at the, at the UN. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor before we get back to the panelists? Please. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Avila and I'm involved with banking, so I'm, I'm part of the corporate sector. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Very quick uh, point for Danilo. You make a lot of emphasis on including social policy and sustainable development. We understand that for social impact to be created and for the funds to really reach those projects, transparency and corruption has to be prevented. So I would like to hear your view as a former president as to like how critical it is for public sanity and transparency to implement it for be able to reach that social impact and sustainability that is needed in Latin America. Then for Rob, you mentioned that one of the negatives right now impacting the China-US trade war is impacting the financial sector. Could you elaborate on that? Thanks. Thank you. We have now three questions. I would uh, get back to the panel uh, to provide some feedback, and then we will have again time for another round of questions. So who would like to start? Well, let me quickly, uh, the representative ILO, uh, to, to answer this, I will, I will respond to the, the two questions that were asked and were addressed to me. First, <clears throat> you see, uh, j just a piece of history. When um, the Millennium Development Goals were formulated. The idea of decent work was not included. Uh, now the whole focus was poverty reduction. Uh, now decent work was not included, although ILO at that time already developed the concept of decent work as one of the key concepts for future development. Uh, now that that's one example of how the UN policy recommendations, you know, the broad, broadest policy recommendations remain deficient. 
afterwards, during the implementation period, there was very little um, optimism that you know, we will get anywhere close to the implementation of Millennium Development Goals. But that period coincided with this rapid growth of China, and all of a sudden the global statistics improved enormously, and that created, that created an, a sense of optimism. Now, uh, coming from that type of experience, um, history, um, I would like to ask ourselves, will something about China help in the future? Belt and Road Initiative, which also has to do with um, infrastructure investment, and which was not mentioned so far, so perhaps it could be useful to hear if there are any views on the potential of Belt and Road Initiative, which, um, uh, which can address the question of uh, infrastructure, but also development more broadly. And obviously, one has to understand, China is a major economic partner of Latin America. According to some opinions, even larger than the United States. I mean, I'm not an economist, so I cannot say this, but I have heard very competent people saying that. So, Belt and Road Initiative would be part of that. Uh, there are developments which you will not find in the halls of the General Assembly or other places in the United Nations, but outside that can help uh, in moving in the direction of Agenda 2030. On the question of the um, corporate concerns when it comes to investment, I fully agree. I mean, the question of transparency, the question of corruption, these are extremely important con questions and the conditions for really for growth. I mean, I'm again coming from Slovenia where we believe that we didn't have much corruption. <laughs> After a while, we discovered that we have more than we knew. And that was linked to lack of transparency in some or let's say quite a few uh, public enterprises that we had. So, I mean, we should not underestimate this, although people in politics may not always be aware of how important that is. So we, I think, have to increase the level of sensitivity to the problem of corruption and increase transparency in corporate management, in decision in specific decision-making, decisions uh, re relating to um, leadership of you know, corporate world in, in, uh, in the developing or in the countries which are hosting foreign investment and so forth. So, you know, agreement, I, I would say, essentially. Yeah. So who would like to address uh, the question on uh, uh, policy tools that was uh, posed in the first uh, instance uh, and the need to find more creative tools in order to address these structural issues? Well, uh, I think uh, it's clear that monetary policy is under decreasing return. But I think it's not still uh, ineffective. Uh, I think uh, probably we will saw in the future some form of the helicopter money. <laughs> uh, that was the last solution that monetary theorists think about the situation, how to uh, stimulate aggregate demand in a situation of global uh, liquidity trump. Money can be dropped from the helicopters to directly to the people. I saw we would saw some kind uh, after the uh, quantity expansion, we will saw to think some quantity expansion uh, without the intermediation of the financial system go directly to the people. Uh, and then one has to be creative, how to develop the way through central bank key stimulate directly the business firm when they make investment and consumers, probably sending money through the mail, something like this. But uh, this is a, a new <laughs> field that have to be uh, think, uh, because we don't confront this situation frequently. About fiscal policy, well, fiscal policy has an intrinsic difference, uh, difficulty respect to monetary policy. Monetary policy, you have 
uh, central bank board that decided. Uh, fiscal policy has to be decided in the Congress. So it may be very difficult uh, to, to find an agreement. But when I, I said productive fiscal policy, I try to distinguish uh, that not all fiscal expansion are created the same. For example, uh, tax reduction to the rich probably will not make the trick. Uh, what we need is some government expenditure that create a an po an positive externality in a way that it increases productivity, global productivity, um, also private sector profitability to make, to, to produce an incentivate investment. Well, a huge idea is a moon program, for example. <laughs> uh, we can think about this situation. The moon program in the city produces a lot of externality to the global economy. Uh, the, crea the creation and development of a new technology that produce new industry that we were not aware that were possible to develop. I think that we have to think big in this kind of project. Uh, instead of infrastructure, roads, uh, airport, ports, we have to think in science, in new big ideas that are able to create a positive externality to the uh, economy and through this channel uh, incentivate investment. Uh, well, to reply to the, the question you, you posed me, uh, and that's regarding our uh, risk scenario of the US-China trade war spilling into the, the financial sphere. And for that, we're looking at a, at a couple of things. Um, so with uh, you know, what we saw earlier this year was China letting the renminbi uh, depreciate below the seven to the dollar threshold, uh, which is sort of seen you know, as a, as a key um, level. And the question there, you know, the extent to which they would continue or otherwise to let the renminbi depreciate. We don't think they will let it depreciate that much more. Uh, but as part of this process, we would see uh, the Chinese authorities probably having to, um, deciding to sell off uh, US treasuries. So that would affect uh, the prices of US treasuries. And you know, we could see sort of action in, these space, in this sort of space. Uh, we could see the president of the US seeing that as uh, sort of an attack. And we could see sort of retaliatory, punitive action in, in response. Um, we've already sort of seen some movements um, in the financial space. So uh, we've, seen, um, uh, we've seen sort of regulators trying to prevent uh, or thinking about trying to prevent U.S. Uh, investment in, um, sorry, pr the U.S. regulators preventing uh, Chinese venture capitalists from going into, into Silicon Valley. There could be efforts, for example, uh, to prevent um, institutional investors from investing in, in Chinese uh, tech. And then we could start to see um, um, efforts by the U.S. to dial down uh, Chinese banks' access to U.S. Uh, dollar-based uh, global financial system. And we've already seen um, you know, one bank coming under the radar of the U.S. Patriot Act, uh, this regarding the extent to which uh, it's been involved in breaking uh, sanctions uh, regarding North Korea. So, you know, we could sort of see a stepping up in, in that space. Um, so that's something to, you know, to watch for. And we see that as, you know, potentially having quite a strong impact on the global financial markets if that were to be ramped up. And that would have a pretty uh, high impact on the global economy. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, now, uh, Ingo, maybe you want to react to some of these questions and maybe add also your own views on opportunities, because you also spoke a lot about risks. What about opportunities? 
<laughs> That's always the hard part, yeah. Um, laying out the challenges and risks is, 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 is much more easier, yeah. No, let me just um, make a, a point or get back to underline that we fully agree with this idea that um, fiscal policy um, should have a much more structural component, and I think this is an important aspect which is rethinking. So we have seen this weakness in productivity growth, um, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, and, and but also um, in many other parts of the world economy. And behind that, of course, is um, um, relatively um, um, slow technological progress, which is a surprise now that we're all um, fascinated by artificial intelligence and machine learning and 3D printing, but um, so far it's not yet um, in the data. Um, and, and related to this um, slow technological progress, of course, is a weak diffusion, uh, which we're seeing. So um, while the technology is often there, it's not diffused to all the sectors. And I do think this creates an important role for, for governments and for public sectors to step in, both in terms of, of, of stimulating um, um, investment in, in certain categories and which specifically um, in ensuring diffusion, but also, um, which was highlighted um, um, earlier, this importance of, of of quality education. Yes, we have made immense progress on, on the educational front in, in getting um, um, kids to school and go, they're going to school longer, but um, in terms of the quality of education, in terms of critical thinking, in terms of problem solving, I think there are immense gaps. And these issues are, are all, all related and need to be addressed comprehensively. And that's, I think, one of the issues that some countries are making progress in some of these fronts, but are, are lagging behind on others, and the result is then uh, uh, it doesn't translate into the, the progress needed in terms of, of, of productivity growth. Thank you, Ingo. I wonder whether there are any... Uh, yes, uh, I see there two hands. So let's keep them very short uh, so that we can have an opportunity to uh, hear the, the answers from the panel. Please, identify yourself. Thank you. Augusto Cabrera. I'm the Deputy Consul General of Peru in New York. Um, three around, China holds around three trillion dollars in uh, foreign exchange reserves. Uh, experts say that uh, around two thirds of those are U.S. Uh, dollars. So this is sort of a background in the um, commercial war, the so-called commercial war between the U.S. And, and China. But I don't know. I wanted to ask you um, how would this play in the long term in this um, the development of this commercial trade, uh, sorry, commercial war. Yes, hello, my name is uh, Peter Seblom. I'm a council, but also a strategic advisor. And uh, um, my question is for Rob and Raul, really. Uh, and we've heard a lot of uh, negativism here, but uh, if you turn it into something positive, uh, perhaps we should also think about the importance of uh, progressing uh, both a sense of positive and real action for development uh, to uh, link up to uh, what Daniel said earlier on. And uh, I was wondering, uh, how the situation looks, uh, as an example, regarding cross-border uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, as an example, the Central African Corridor that is uh, built at the moment, where you build road, power lines, and a very good uh, fiber optic backbone, all in one, across a whole region of Africa. And you can already see that it has got positive effects. And uh, different countries choose different methods of contributing. But it's all done uh, with the support of uh, public-private pri partnerships and uh, the African Development Bank. So I wonder, wouldn't it be something like that, sending a positive sig signal at the same time as you show action, have a very beneficial effect in today's situation? Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, who would like to answer to uh, this question? Part of the question. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the current situation in which uh, what we have, in my point of view, is uh, an excess of saving. 
that's the reason why we observed so low real interest rates across the world. So uh, we are in a situation in which we have a lot of savings and too little investment opportunity uh, from the perspective of the private sector. Well, uh, how to solve this? The central bank has been working, uh, being creative, and my point of view is that now is a, probably the, the, the term for the fiscal, uh, uh, for the fiscal expansion. Well, the developing countries uh, has a paradoxical situation because we have an excess of saving in the global economy, but the developing world uh, still have difficulty to access to this money and to use productivity this money. And that has to be with the financial system and with the risk premium. Uh, how, I think uh, we have to think hard how to, uh, from the perspective of, of, of developing an emerging economy, how to assess a this excess of saving. Because I think uh, part of the solution is that this excess of saving in the in so key economy can be used to accelerate the development and growth of the emerging economy. Uh, but exactly how to found this uh, mechanism, uh, how to intermediate through the financial uh, system this excess of savings is what is difficult and the system is not working properly, founding a way to do it. Uh, this is something that has to be developed because it's a relative new situation. Yeah, uh, to add um, to the conversation on, on this point uh, and, you know, looking specifically at Latin America, so, you know, we've already discussed sort of the extent to which there's limited space on the fiscal side. You know, one thing uh, I think that, you know, economies that will do well in this um, weaker growth phase will be those that are trying to uh, improve the business environment, open up the economy. Uh, we've had uh, quite a bit of success in Latin American countries like Chile. Uh, Chile is growing relatively well at the moment. A lot of focus on countries like Brazil um, that you know, have a reformist government trying to set the fiscal house in order, but also uh, in terms of lifting growth, um, arguably more importantly, trying to improve the playing field for the private sector to invest in infrastructure. Um, and there's also related to that quite an ambitious privatization program, which will be quite attractive. And you know, there was this question about you know, what are the opportunities out there? Uh, I think foreign investors will be looking at you know, some opportunities in, in places like Brazil that at this stage uh, are going through a privatization program. Um, and Peter, you know, you mentioned the public-private partnerships, but also how the multilaterals are playing a key role at this stage. Um, I think you know they will continue to do so, but it's difficult to see sort of a strong ramping up of that investment process. Um, and we go back to you know countries have to uh, improve the playing field for these projects to you know to get off the ground and. Uh, and to become realized as well. So I think, you know, yes, um, um, you know, fiscal space is, is an issue. Uh, you see, you have to see which countries have space to, uh, to uh, come out with counter-cyclical policies, but countries that will be doing well, I think, in this phase will be those that sort of are improving their uh, economies, making it more attractive for the private sector. Well, I'd like to add just a piece of information. Um, now, while we are talking, there is a meeting in the United Nations about financing of development. And there are various innovative models discussed uh, at a fairly high level. Uh, one of those models I happen to know uh, has to do with transboundary water infrastructure. Now, transboundary 
um, investment in transboundary uh, infrastructure may be actually one of the interesting areas for future work, and, and one has to think about, uh, you know, about um, fiscal policy space and tools, and link it to such needs that that clearly exist. And I know that one of the more innovative models, financing of development, that will be presented or is being presented in, in, in uh, at the UN now, has to do with initiative um, led by Switzerland, Canada, and some partners in Africa, plus um, some pension funds in the United States. You know how to draw money from different. Uh, uh, from different sources, invest that in an area which traditionally hasn't been a high yield, you know, very profitable area, which is characterized by potential risks that, of course, investments have to be aware of, but still uh, models are being developed that may actually overcome all these problems. I think that this is very typical for our time when, when such opportunities have to be looked at much more seriously than before. And obviously, one would have to look at what emerged from the discussion today and see if there are useful ideas that can be applied either you know, where they are proposed or elsewhere. Thank you very much, Danilo. Uh, we are coming uh, to the uh, end of this panel, but before closing, I'd like to ask uh, each panelist to uh, provide us with one minute of takeaways from this session and from this conversation. So I will uh, start with Ingo. Yeah, I, I just want to um, emphasize um, that um, the economic trends we are um, seeing right now, they are to a significant extent um, um, driven by political factors, and it is about um, um, analyzing and better understanding these, these linkages and then uh, addressing them. And I think that's why also this um, conference um, um, is so useful. Um, and at which I, I often think this makes it very difficult um, to, to really get it and we need to have a better understanding of political economy dimensions. Now when it comes to the economic front, I think what we need to see is we need to address the short-term um, um, vulnerabilities and um, reduce the, the, the uncertainty. This related of course to the, the trade war, also to the Brexit and other financial factors. And we need to shift away as we have seen from this reliance on monetary policy towards more fiscal but also more structural, but then again, there's a big question about um, what do we understand with um, structural. And um, we also need to boost medium-term growth, and I think this has a lot to do with what was mentioned on, in terms of like, like corruption or transparency on how can we better manage um, um, specific sectors of the, of the economy. Thank you, Ingo. That was one minute. Thank you very much. Uh, Danilo, would you give us your takeaways? Well, actually, the only thing I can say is a quote from Charles Dickens. We live in the best of times and the worst of times. And we just have to make sure that the feeling of the worst of time doesn't prevail. Have to look into the feeling of the best of times and be innovative. I think this is less than one minute. Thank you. Um, well, I'll just sort of uh, finish by saying, you know, yes, we're going into uh, a very important U.S. election cycle into 2020. A lot of focus is, are, is on the merchandise trade war between U.S. and China. Uh, but, you know, we think what's going to shape things is this risk and the extent to which it materializes that the trade war goes into other spaces uh, as this strategic rivalry between the US and China continues uh, to take place and we see more uh, conflict in the technology space, investment space, security uh, and finance. Hi, I will uh, switch to Spanish again. <laughs> Yo esperaría que eh, evitemos una recesión el próximo año eh, sin embargo, creo que no debemos tenerle miedo a una recesión, creo que es parte de la realidad económica, la tendremos en algún momento. Es eh, alguna vez, eh, eh, una, la presidenta de la Reserva Federal, eh, Yellen, dijo, las expansiones no mueren de viejas, siempre hay alguna causa. Eh, la gran pregunta es... Eh, ¿Qué será esta causa de trade war? Podría ser. 
eh, el, el canal puramente comercial no parece ser tan fuerte para generar una recesión global, pero el canal de la incertidumbre es demasiado fuerte. Entonces, en un entorno de una expansión vieja, un ciclo viejo, eh, una incertidumbre como la que se genera por la guerra comercial sí es capaz de generar una recesión. Eh, lo que temo es que si se diera una recesión en este entorno, donde la política monetaria ha agotado mucho de sus instrumentos, la salida de la recesión podría ser muy complicada. Este, no le temería yo a una recesión de seis meses de un año, pero sí a una situación donde la economía perdiera todo dinamismo y por falta de experiencia o de creatividad no tengamos instrumentos para sacar a la economía de la recesión. Espero que eso lo evitemos. Yo creo que esa es la, eh, la parte con la que quiero terminar, queriendo ser moderadamente optimista. Okay, thank you very much. The choreography now allows me to say one word just to wrap up. Uh, and uh, it is that I was really struck by the point made by Rob about the uncertainty index. And I think what was the common thread of this panel is that uncertainty that more than doubled since 2013, as you said, in your index, it does not necessarily have to turn into fear. That's the key message. There are uh, possibilities of addressing uh, the uncertain future in a creative manner, thinking also of the creative tools, that even within a limited policy space may allow politicians to respond to this uncertainty in a way that is not really short term, but looks at the vision of the development that, as Vinicio said, should link uh, aspirations and the commitments that uh, have been taken over the 2030 agenda. So, on this tone, that I, I want to be uh, positive, I, uh, I leave the floor to uh, Natasha uh, for uh, instructions about, uh, uh, about the lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you for respecting all the times. Thank you for your engagement.